Hi, Roger. We're just we're just muted right now. I think I think the sound's working fine. All right, Dr. Seven, thank you everyone for joining us again for week two of the Grain Marketing Basics Workshop, which was brought to you by the Corn Marketing Program of Michigan MSU Extension, the Michigan Soybean Committee, and the Michigan Wheat Program. I'm Claire Dewey, and I will be the moderator of the program. And today we'll be covering the basics of the strategies of grain marketing. Just a few housekeeping things to go over before we get started. If you missed last week and would like, or you would like to rewatch it, Um, I'm not sure if your your audio is working, Claire, but we can't hear you. I'm hearing her. Oh, oh sorry about that. Um, can you hear? Can everyone hear me now? Oh, awesome. Right, that's but a that, that's a me problem. Then I need to fix that. <laughs> So I'll go back over our housekeeping. So if you did miss last week or you want to rewatch last week, you can head over to www.micorn.org slash events. If you click on grain marketing, you can review the video from last week as well as all the materials that we have. Um, that's where all the materials from this week will also be posted once uh, we are done with this week's workshop. Again, this is a basics workshop, so no questions are stupid. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll send out an email tomorrow with the links and any of the resources, and they will be posted on our website. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Matt to go ahead and get started with week two of our Grain Marketing Basics workshop. Great, thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, just, just before we start, um, I'd like to, to thank Claire again for all of her work putting this together, as well as Roger for agreeing to be here to, to help out with the Q&A. Um, uh, if you have questions uh, during the talk, um, if you can use the, the Q&A box rather than the chat, it just makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, and with that, we'll share my screen and get started. All right, so just just a, a kind of a quick review of uh, the goal of this workshop and how tonight's um, session kind of fits into our overarching goal. Um, so we want to, to really understand the differences between cash price futures and basis and really kind of know them like the back of our hand um, so that when we're thinking about these markets, we're thinking really clearly and we understand kind of what we need to do when basis is strengthening, when it's weakening, um, how can we tell that basis is likely to strengthen, kind of all of those points. Um, then we're going to talk through, and this is kind of the, the big feature of tonight, is talking through a, a few different really basic grain pricing tools, um, and then knowing the market circumstances when we're going to want to use those tools. So forward contracts, delayed pricing contracts, basis contracts, um, as well as how we can use the cash market um, opportunistically. And then kind of just building confidence so that you kind of have the knowledge base that you need to go and work with your merchandiser or work with your elevator to kind of come up with a plan that works for you. Um, so kind of giving you the basics that then you can kind of search out additional uh, resources as you, as you need them. So what's on the docket for tonight? Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna spend a lot of time going through the, the pricing decision chart that was emailed out to you. So I, I'll have it on the screen, but if you, you know, have a copy, I think I would really encourage you to kind of pull it up next to the Zoom or, or print it out if you have that capability, because um, we're going to be going back to it a lot, and I'm going to be referencing kind of different quadrants on that chart um, a lot. So I'm going to introduce that um, and talk about it a lot, as well as kind of all of the different um, choices that you have and tools that you have um, for the different market situations. Um, 
yeah, so I just said that. So uh, when to use the cash market, how to use the cash market, uh, when you want to think about delayed pricing and forward contracts, uh, what's a basis contract, when is it the right choice, uh, hedge to arrive, um, and then kind of depending on the time, uh, I might kind of just give a really brief introduction of options. So we'll, so, you know, everything's basics as you, as you, those of you who are here last week know, everything's at a basics level, um, but we'll dive in a little bit deeper on uh, some of the cash market, forward contracts, basis contracts, and hedge to arrive tonight. Um, then we'll probably do a really brief, really high level, just what is an option? What is a call? What is a put? And then next week, uh, we'll have much more in-depth examples where we kind of go through and I work out examples of, you know, how you use a call and how you use a put. So, um, so if you're really, really excited about options, I don't want you to get your hopes up too high, but I do want you to come back next week. Um, yeah, so also next week, uh, we'll have um, guest speakers from MAC um, who are going to be kind of doing a, opening it up for Q&A, but really focused on logistics. So kind of not necessarily, you know, what do I want to do, but I know what I want to do. And then how do I do it? So, you know, how do I go about, um, you know, making a basis contract? Um, and so they'll have, they'll have great insight into that. And then we'll, we'll have some time for review next week as well to try and pull all these pieces together. All right. So just to, to review, um, what we did last week, we talked about how the cash price has two components. So it has the, the futures price, which is really we can think of as a, a world price. Anything that's happening in the world that affects uh, the demand for grain is going to affect that price. Um, so supply and demand factors anywhere play a role in the futures price. And then basis, which is how kind of your localized supply and demand factors um, affect, affect the price that you can get. Um, so I know last week we talked about kind of things that can affect basis. Um, you know, just a classic example would be if you have uh, an ethanol plant and you had really bad weather in your specific location, you're going to expect really strong basis because there's a lot of demand in your local area. So last week we also talked about how we can use a hedge. Um, so using a futures contract to lock in a net price. So I'm going to um, store my grain. I'm going to sell a futures contract, kind of looking out a few months, and that's going to lock me into a net price, but I'm still going to be subject to basis risk. So we started with the hedge really not because it's necessarily the tool that you're going to be using the most, it, it almost certainly isn't, uh, but because it kind of gives us a really nice intuition for um, what the futures market is um, to really try and understand that first. Um, and then many of the tools that we're going to be talking about today kind of take advantage of that futures market. All right, so, so here it is. So this is, this is kind of the, the most important slide. Um, so this is the kind of quadrant pricing tool. I think it's pricing decision chart. Uh, and this is for cash product sellers. So, you know, if you were Kellogg's, you would have a totally different chart, but, but we're kind of assuming that you're not. Uh, so this is for people who are selling selling cash grain and kind of what options that they should be taking based on different market signals. So this was, uh, I think, created by Jake Ferris, who was a, a faculty member here at MSU um, a ways back. Um, and so it's kind of, now it's used much more broadly uh, outside of just MSU, but it was created here. So that's kind of just a fun fact. So, so what's going on in this, in this chart? I'm going to kind of pull it up in front of me and I'll be looking at it along with you. Uh, so there's two, two things that we have to know about a market setting, right? So, um, or sorry, there's two things that we might, that we want to know about what's going to happen in a market, right? So we want to know whether the futures is going to go up or down. Um, so it's kind of the, the global supply and demand such that we're going to get kind of higher futures prices, higher global prices, or is it going down? Um, so that's, you know, hard to predict, right? You know, if I was uh, a, a perfect weatherman and I knew the weatherman in every location in the world, um, I would probably be um, pretty good at knowing where the futures price is going, but, I, but I'm not. So it's, 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 tough. it's tough to always know kind of whether the futures is going up or down. Uh, but if you have an expectation, um, that helps you know whether are you on the top half of this quadrant of this chart 
or are you kind of down on the, the bottom half of, of this graph? So, so that's the futures element. And then there's um, basis and whether it's strengthening or weakening. And that, that's a little bit easier to forecast. So you kind of go back and you look at the basis in your local area uh, over the past few years um, for a given time of year. And you can really see um, strongly some pretty strong trends. So, um, you know, last week, and you can go back to the video if you want, um, we showed kind of how basic historically has really strengthened as we go from harvest time kind of into July of the next year, thinking about corn. Um, so th there's some pretty predictable trends in terms of whether we think basis is strengthening or weakening. You know, whether it's strengthening or weakening enough, that's gonna depend on your, your storage costs and your, your opportunity cost of time. So back, back to the chart. So we have futures up on the top half, and then we have futures down on the bottom half. And then we have basis weakening on the left half, and we have a strengthening basis on the right half. So, so there's four possible market scenarios, right? So we can have futures, we expect them to go up, and we expect the basis to weaken. That's over in the, the top left here. We could have, we expect the futures to go up and we expect that the basis is strengthening. So that's over on the top right. Uh, we could have basis weakening, futures down, or, or we expect that futures will go down. Or we could have, we, our expectation is that the futures are falling, but the basis is strengthening. And in each of these situations, kind of the tools that we want to use are different. Um, I'm gonna look at a, just gonna check the, uh, so David Williams asks, what's the difference between a hedge and a hedge to arrive? Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit later on. Um, and it looks like Roger is, is typing an answer as we speak. Um, so that's great. Um, so whether or not your, your futures are going up or down or your basis is weakening or strengthening is going to depend it's going to affect when you want to lock in those prices. So I, I know I said this a lot last week, I was kind of starting to sound like a broken record, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again. So, so that because there's two components of the cash price that you get, uh, you don't necessarily want to lock them in at the same time. You want to make a, a choice that you like both um, and take advantage of the flexibility that you have. So to start over here on the, the top left side, um, if basis is, we expect basis to be weakening, and futures to be strengthening, well, then we wanna lock in the basis right now, right? Because we only expect it to get worse. So if, we, if there's a, a strong basis now, we, we might expect it to weaken, but we wanna lock it in right now. Uh, but the, on the future, we wanna wait because we think it's going to go up. So we're going to take advantage of that and hold off on locking in that, that futures price. So we'll, we'll talk through kind of each of these quadrants um, in more depth and, and touch on the, the tools that are in them. So, so one thing to note is that you can see kind of the, the actions under in each quadrant. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about the ones that don't use options. So, so anything that has a put or a call in it is, is something that we're going to dive into more detail next week. So I am going to kind of just briefly talk about them but not in the context of this pricing decision chart. That will be next week. So we need to form expectations about both futures and basis. As I mentioned before, this is easier to do for basis than for futures, uh, but it's something that we need to do for both if we wanna pick a tool. All right, so I, I zoomed way in on the upper left-hand quadrant, right? So now you can see it a, a little more clearly. Um, we have futures, we have futures going up, and we have cash going up as well. But but look, it's it's not going up as fast, right? So you have cash is kind of close to futures um, when we're over at the kind of beginning of the the x-axis, um, and then as time goes on, um, the gap between futures and cash gets larger and larger. So what does that mean? That means that your basis is weakening. So we want to lock in basis right now. And we want to lock in the futures later. So jumping over to the upper right hand, um, 
In this case, we can see that both futures and cash are going up, but the cash is going up much more quickly than the futures is. Uh, why? That's because we have a strengthening basis. So in this case, we don't want to lock in basis now because basis is really weak right now and we expect it to strengthen. So we want to hold off on that. And we want to hold off on the futures too because we also expect that the futures are going to be increasing. So in this case, we kind of don't want to lock in a price because we think that the pricing situation is going to get more favorable on both fronts, on both futures and on basis. Um, and and don't, don't, don't panic. We'll, we'll go through all of these actions um, in, in more detail. I just kind of want to really drive home kind of what this pricing chart is, what the four quadrants are, and then we'll, we'll jump into more of the specific tools. All right, so now we're on the, the lower left-hand side of the pricing decision chart. So, so what do we have here? So we have both prices are going down. So we have kind of futures decreasing, and then we have the cash price decreasing at a faster rate, right? You can see it's a, it's a steeper slope here. And that means that the gap is widening. Um, and that means that basis is weakening. So in this case, we wanna lock in the basis right now. It's only gonna get worse. And we wanna lock in the price right now. Um, it's only gonna get worse. So, you know, <laughs> given that a little bit of foreshadowing, not gonna surprise you, you're gonna wanna sell because the situation, the situation is only getting worse. Um, So over on the, the bottom right-hand side, um, now we have our futures going down, but our basis is strengthening. So you can see here, kind of the, the cash price is getting closer to the futures, even though both are decreasing. So in this case, we wanna wait on the basis. We think it's gonna get better, but we wanna lock in the futures right now. So th those are the four quadrants. Um, so kind of the, the setup of most of the rest of tonight is going to be kind of picking one of those quadrants um, and then kind of zooming in on um, each of the tools that you can use within that quadrant um, that can that can really help you know you accomplish this your goal, which is listed at the bottom here, which is kind of locking in the right price now and then locking in the prices you don't want right now later. All right. Um, yeah, one one thing before I, I jump in too much farther. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't recommend ever kind of just using one tool, right? If you're, if you're marketing 50,000 bushels, you don't want kind of all your eggs in one basket. So, so this quadrant tool is not to say kind of, this is the one tool you should use, go out and do it right now. No, it's saying here's a few options um, and you kind of, kind of pick from those to create a diversified strategy, right? So, you know, every quadrant doesn't just have one tool, it has four or five. Um, and so um, you might use a few there. And then if you're kind of not sure whether futures is, is gonna go up or gonna go down, you might pick a few from the strengthening and, and pick a few from the weakening so that you're kind of protected on either side. Um, so, so this is really just to kind of fix ideas about what it means for basis to be strengthening and weakening in terms of picking a pricing tool. It's not to say, you know, run out and market all your bushels um, with, you know, action number one in this quadrant. So. That's just kind of a, a note of caution, uh, but I still think the tool is really powerful in terms of um, kind of ruling out some some pricing tools that it's just not the right market scenario for. All right, so we're on the top right hand side of the the pricing tool, um, and so what do we have going on here? So we have um, futures and cash both going up, um, and the basis is strengthening, so the cash is getting closer to the futures. So um, the actions that are kind of meant for this quadrant is, is storing cash. So this assumes that you have some on-farm storage and basically you, you hold the grain and you wait for improved prices, right? Because both the futures and the basis are getting more favorable as time goes on. So you don't wanna price anything right now. You, you wanna hold off um, and price it when it's more favorable. So if you sell at harvest, you're, you, know, you have the cash right away, which is nice, um, but you missed out on both higher prices and better basis. Um, so, you know, say you don't have on-farm storage or it's all, all filled up, um, then you, your option is um, delayed pricing. So you deliver to the elevator, 
Um, the elevator takes ownership of the grain. Typically, um, you're going to kind of pay pay some minimum fee. This is basically a fee that you're paying for both storage and kind of the flexibility of being able to choose when you price your grain. So they have the grain, um, and then you choose kind of when you'd like to get it priced um, within the specified time. So just a, a refresher, um, since the last slide kind of had storing cash as, as one of the options, just a, a refresher on what the cash market is. Um, so this is a price agreement for immediate delivery. So you have the grain and you're selling it right now. Uh, so what are the advantages here? So advantages is the cash is available quickly, kind of as soon as you need the cash, you can have the cash, assuming you have the grain. Um, and the price is known at the time of sale, so you don't have any kind of uncertainty about what the price is. You know the price when you make the contract. Um, this is something we talked about last week. Um, so uh, with a hedge, you know, you're obligated to have 5,000 bushels. Um, not, not so um, if you're just selling on the cash market, kind of however much you have, you can sell. Um, and then kind of one advantage is that it's simple, right? You, you know, you're selling grain for money, just like you would sell anything else. Um, and, and you can deal with people that you know. Um, the big disadvantages is that you're really not taking advantage of the flexibility that's afforded to you. So, so maybe sometimes you don't need that flexibility, but oftentimes you probably do. Um, so the timing is, could be, you know, inopportune is sort of a polite way of putting it. Um, if you're at harvest and your basis is really weak, it could be extremely bad to have to, to have to sell in the cash market and not be able to take advantage of a basis that's strengthening over time. Um, and then if you're thinking about kind of getting a price on new crop, um, so this is kind of knowing the price you're going to get before you, before you harvest, you know, before you plant even, um, you know, you can't do that in the cash market that requires um, some sort of forward contract that you agree on a price before you even have the grain on hand. Just gonna check the Q and A. Yeah, um, so elaborate on store cash. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me, sorry, let me jump back. So, so store cash, um, by that I mean, you know, you, you have the grain um, and you're just storing it on farm. So it's not priced, this is unpriced grain, right? So you had the harvest, um, you, you got the grain and you're just storing it. So, so why are we calling it storing cash? You know, it's basically the idea that, you know, this, this grain is essentially money eventually, right? It just hasn't been converted to money yet. So you're, you're storing it and then you're waiting uh, for prices to rise to sell it. And then you'll sell it in the cash market. So um, storing cash, you know, holding off and waiting, uh, they, they, they mean the same thing, right? So it's just, you, you have the grain in storage and it's unpriced grain. And that's, you know, kind of sometimes maybe there's a, a negative connotation around unpriced grain, but you know, in this case, in this, in this quadrant where you, you think prices are gonna rise and basis is gonna strengthen, you know, you want unpriced grain because you wanna be able to take advantage of, of those increases in the future. So delayed pricing. So this is an agreement that delivered grain will be priced at a time selected by the seller. So that's, um, so you pick the timing when you'd like to get it priced. Um, and the elevator owns the grain and charges a fee for the, the service and the storage. So the advantage is that you can kind of price when the market seems right to you or price when you really need the cash to pay off a loan. Um, so you have um, that advantage um, and as well as the flexibility of there's no quantity restrictions, right? So it doesn't have to be 5,000 bushels. It's kind of however much you, you want to put in a delayed pricing contract. Generally, you'll be able to, to draw up a contract that works for that. Um, and then again, I, I repeated this advantage. This is Really, kind of any time that you're you're dealing in a simple contract with your local elevator is, you know, you're not, you don't have to open a, a brokerage firm, or, or sorry, you don't have to open a brokerage account. Um, you can kind of just deal with people that you're familiar with, which you know, the, the, there's some benefit to that. Um, and then, kind of, you'll notice this has the same the same disadvantages as before, right? Um, so. 
uh, the timing, you know, maybe prices go down, maybe kind of things only get worse. You have kind of the, the you your, your, sorry, <laughs> you, you have the full risk, right? You have, this is unpriced grain. Um, if things deteriorate, if the situation gets bad, you know, you, you don't have anything locked in. Um, that's a disadvantage as well as you can establish a price kind of as you're making acreage choices in the spring. All right, so here's just um, a simple example that we're gonna walk through about delayed pricing. So let's say you have a October harvest price of, of 1250, so this is soybeans, um, and you're, you're short of storage space. So you, you, know, you don't have anywhere to put it, but you kind of wish you did because you think that prices are gonna rise in the next few months and that the basis um, is likely to strengthen. Um, and so how do we, why do we think it's likely to strengthen? Well, if it's currently very weak, we typically think that it's likely to strengthen, especially if it's below kind of the average of the past few years for a given location, we think it's likely to kind of go back towards that average, um, you know, kind of regression to the mean, if that's a, a concept that you're familiar with. Um, you know, if not, it's just, you know, whatever was happening the past few years, you know, probably things are going to trend that direction again. So, um, Let's say that we get to December and, and the price is 1290. So you're glad that you held off, kind of you get the full 1290, that's your, your price after selling, but then you have to pay um, this, this fee, this delayed pricing fee um, that kind of accounts for both your storage as well as kind of the service of the elevator. Um, so this is a fee that you would pay the elevator um, for the, the benefit of um, having them both store your grain and give you the flexibility to price when you want. So after you subtract that off, what did you receive? You got a net of 1270. So you still came out ahead in this example. Um, you know, obviously you can imagine if the December price was still 1250, um, then you wouldn't have come out of ahead. You would have gotten a net of 1230 and you would have kind of wished you had just sold before. So this is, this is something to do when you, when you think prices are going up. You know, if you're, if you're not sure, if you think they're likely to stay the same, you wouldn't want to do this. Uh, so Mary Shepard asks, how long are the delayed terms? Um, how long of a window do you have to choose a price? Um, so that's something that would be kind of worked out with the elevator. Um, you know, I haven't heard of really short windows. I, I normally would think kind of, you know, four months in the ballpark or, or longer. Um, but um, I'm not exactly sure about what, what kind of the, the most standard length of window is. Um, I bet Roger does. All right. So now we're gonna move. So we were up in the top right before. And now we're going to move down to the bottom left. So what's going on here? So we have, we have both futures and cash decreasing. And we have cash decreasing at a faster rate, which means that the basis is weakening. Um, so kind of what are, what are the options here? So one is to sell cash. So, you know, before I talked about storing cash, where we kind of take the grain and we store it. Well, this is the same idea. We take the grain and we sell it right now because the prices are going down and we want to you know, get it before it gets any lower than it's already is. So, you know, you don't wait, you just, you just sell in the spot market. So another, another option is to forward contract. So you, you lock in both your, your basis and your futures price. Um, and then you can deliver kind of at a later date. And this is, you know, very often used um, with new crops. So this is when you're, um, you don't have the grain yet, uh, but you know that you're going to have it in a few months. Um, and you want to establish a price before kind of it gets any lower than it already is. Um, so, so more on forward contracts. So these are price agreements for future delivery. 
So what are the advantages? Um, price is known at the time of sale. Um, and additionally, price can be known you know, before you even make your acreage and your input choices, uh, which is kind of can provide some peace of mind and, and be pretty advantageous. Um, and again, you know, this is something that you'd work with at your local elevator or whatever, you know, elevator you, you know, choose to work with. Um, so you have, you have those advantages. But there's some pretty, pretty big disadvantages, especially talking about forward contracts on, on new crop where you're selling something that you don't have. And really, I, I would think of this as kind of an obvious problem whenever you're selling something that you don't have yet is, you know, what if you don't get it, right? So what if the weather is bad? What if something happens um, and you end up short? And if you think about, you know, if, if your harvest is bad, you know, chances are that your neighbor's harvest is also bad. And um, typically if everyone's harvest is bad, you have really high prices. So it's kind of a, a double whammy. So not only did you not have the grain that you need to fulfill this, this forward contract, but when you go to the cash market to buy it because you have to you have to fulfill this contract somehow the price is going to be really high so so that that's the disadvantage um and then i have this is sort of a generalization i mean this is not a hard and fast rule but you know often these offer lower net returns than than a futures contract but you have the benefit of not having to open a brokerage account you don't have to worry about margin calls um you kind of just make an agreement up front, um, and then you know the price that you're going to get. But I, I wanna highlight again that this is, um, you're locking in both your basis and your futures price at the same time. So, so you know, before you enter one of these, make sure that you like kind of both components of the agreement. You are happy with the futures price and you're happy to be locking in basis right now. All right, so now I have, um, a chalkboard video uh, that's about 15 minutes uh, of me working through um, some of the tools, really simple examples of the tools that I just described. Um, so I think Claire has that. If I can stop share screen and she can take over. In this video, we're going to talk about a few tools that you can use when you want to lock in your basis and your futures price at the same time. And when are the right times to use those tools? So first, we're going to consider the situation where you think futures are going to go up. That is, you expect the futures price to increase over time. And you expect the basis to be strengthening. So, if we have futures here and cash here, how can we see that the basis is strengthening? Because the difference here in the future is smaller than the difference here. So we have a strengthening basis and an increasing futures price. And in fact, it's not just that we need a strengthening basis, we need a basis that's strengthening enough to pay us for storage. So in a situation like this, um, what's, what's a good tool? in the cash market. Um, so here we're not, we're not talking about any sort of futures contracts. We're just talking about different ways to utilize the cash market. So the first is we're just going to store the grain. So let's say the current cash price is $5 and we're going to store. And let's say that our storage is two cents per month. So we have this screen in storage. Um, let's say that we're, we're going to look out uh, four months and so we're going to plan on selling this grain in, in June. So you can kind of already see where I'm headed with this. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. It's the cash market, right? So we could be in a situation where prices go up. So let's imagine they go up to $6. That's great. We still have to pay our storage. So we're going to subtract off 8 cents 
we're going to assume this is on farm storage. Uh, might be more if you have to pay for storage off farm. And so, what's our net price? We're going to get five ninety two. So in this in this case, uh, when prices go up, just as you can see from over here, um, it paid off, right? So we were we are glad that we stored. But prices don't always go up. You can think about a situation where prices go down. So let's say prices we expected them to go up, but instead they're going to go down to four dollars. We still have to pay our eight cent storage. And we're le left with a net price of three ninety two. So as you can see, kind of the moral of the story here is that in order for these tools to work out, when you have these expectations, your expectations have to be true, right? They have to kind of be correct expectations. Um, so here, where prices went up, we, we considered a situation where we keep this grain in storage all the way out till the end of June. Um, but one, one advantage here is that, you know, you don't have to do that, right? So you're, if you, if prices kind of are already at $6 in April or in May, you can take that grain out of storage, sell it then, and then let's say we only had it in storage for two months. We only paid four cents in storage. And then we're up to 596. So you have that flexibility when you store. So that's one tool for when we're in this, this situation where we expect futures to go up and basis to be strengthening. Another tool is the delayed pricing contract. So here we're going to be kind of sending our grain to the elevator, paying a fee um, for both storage and the flexibility. And then we're going to come in later and choose when we want to price it. So um, we're still in the cash market. Um, we're still not kind of utilizing the futures market at all. Um, and why are we in the cash market? Because basis is strengthening and futures are going up. So. We, we want the futures price later, and we also want the basis later. So now we're going to say, that the delayed pricing fees, I'm just gonna call these DP for delayed pricing, it's going to be 20 cents. And we're going to consider the same two possible price scenarios. So now what happens? So we're at the cash price of five, it goes up to six, but we have to take out our 20 cents so we get a net price of 580. And similarly, when prices go down, we're left with a net price of only 380. So we came out kind of way behind here, right? So we, we had our expectations, they were wrong, and we really paid the price. When we're in the situation where futures price, we expect them to decrease, and we expect the basis to be weakening. So this is the lower left-hand quadrant of the pricing decision chart. So here we have a, a few options. So the, the first is, is the simplest and that's just to sell cash, right? So 
We already have a strong basis. This gap is small and we expect it to get larger. So we expect basis to be weakening. So we want the basis right now. And we also expect futures to be decreasing. So we also want the futures price right now. So because we like both of these prices right now, we can lock them in both right now by selling in the cash market. So kind of over here, we have our cash price of five. There's no storage costs because we're selling right now. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of all there is to it. So you know, prices might go up, prices might go down, but it doesn't matter because we've already locked in the price that was there. So that's that's a, a simple example. Um, and it's important to know kind of when when that's the right choice. Um, so when we're when we're in this setting, though, this this isn't the only option that we have. Uh, we can also think about a forward contract. So here we're going to agree to deliver the grain at some future time at some set price. So so this isn't a futures contract. Um, this is this is a forward contract. Um, so uh, one one big advantage here is that we don't have kind of this obligation to come up with five thousand bushels, right? So we can. We can set a forward contract for, for much smaller, much smaller quantities uh, working with our elevator. So here, let's say the forward contract price is going to be five twenty five. So we have 525 and we're going to agree to deliver this at the end of June again. So we're coming into this contract right now and we're going to, the contract's going to be fulfilled at the end of June. So you could also imagine uh, a setting where uh, we're forward contracting for the new crop, right? So, so here I have it set up where we, we already have the grain um, and we're gonna come up with a forward contract um, in the future. Uh, you could also imagine where we're entering a forward contract for grain that we're going to plant in a few months and harvest next fall. Um, so, so the principles are, are similar. Uh, the one difference is when forward contracting a, a new crop, you always have the risk that you come up short, right? So you forward contracted you know, X amount of bushels, you have bad weather, you don't have them, and then you have to kind of figure out how you're going to come up with that grain. In the cash market, so that that's one difference between forward contracting old crop and new crop. But let's say we're we're forward contracting uh, old crop, and we have this price of five twenty five. Um, so let's say that we have storage costs of two cents per month again. So this is on farm farm storage of two cents per month. So so what's our net price? Uh, well, I'm going to write it in the prices go up column, but it, it doesn't actually matter what the prices go to, right? Because we're already in this contract. So whether they go up or down, we have 525. Minus eight cents. Going to leave us with 517. If prices go down, we have the exact same thing, right? So we're already we're already locked in. And this is exactly what we wanted, right? We we thought that prices were going down, and we wanted to lock in right now. So so in this world where prices go up, we'd say, you know, darn, we could have been here selling six dollar corn, and instead we're at five seventeen. But our expectation was that we were going to be in the prices going down world, um, and in that case, we would have come out very far ahead. And important to note, we also came out ahead rather than if we had just sold in the cash market, right? So because our storage costs were, were manageable and they were, were less than this differential, um, we came out ahead. What if we don't have on-farm storage? So now we need to, to go off-farm to store the grain, uh, which is going to, to cost more, um, more in opportunity costs, essentially. So, 
let's say that it costs us five cents per month to store off farm uh, plus our two cents opportunity cost, right? So we still have to pay interest on our operating loan. So we still have opportunity costs for delaying kind of when we when we sell the grain. So we had two cents per month opportunity cost before. We have that as well, plus five cents per month um, to pay for off farm storage. So that's going to leave us seven cents per month multiplied by four since we're pricing at the end of June here. So that's going to be 28 cents. So instead of eight cents, we have 28 cents, which is going to mean that our net price here is 497. So in this case, we come to the, the opposite conclusion as before, right? So, so before we, we were glad that we didn't just sell in the, the cash market. Uh, we, we made money by doing a, a forward contract, but in this case, it doesn't make sense. So, so why is that? That's because our storage costs went up. So the, the opportunity cost of holding onto this grain for a longer period of time goes up, which is going to shift us to want to sell in the cash market now. So this is just uh, one illustration of kind of knowing what your storage cost is, is so important to being able to pick the right tool to market your grain. All right. Um, so I'm just checking the, the Q&A real quick. Uh, so Rich asks, um, on a forward contract, uh, when do the storage prices start? Um, and so, really whenever, whenever you get the grain that, yeah, that you're trying to sell, right? So um, if you're entering into a forward contract um, in October with grain that you already have, the storage costs start right away, right? So, um, you know, this, I'm probably kind of thinking this, this is on-farm storage. So then you have to know your opportunity cost of time, right? When you, when you store grain, you can't sell it. You can't be paying off interest. You can't be kind of investing it in other, in other things. You're not getting interest on it. Uh, so there, there's a cost there, even if you have kind of tons of empty storage on site, um, there's still a cost. Um, if you enter a forward contract in the spring uh, for grain that you intend to harvest in the fall, then you don't pay any storage until you harvest, right? So um, just kind of depends on the timing um, with whether this is kind of new crop versus old crop. All right, so now we're moving to the bottom right quadrant. So, so what's going on here? So we have both the futures price and the cash price decreasing, but the futures price is decreasing much more rapidly and that's because the basis is strengthening here. So even though kind of globally, uh, things are getting less favorable in terms of supply and demand, um, in your local area, um, relative to that, it's getting more favorable. So you have a stronger basis, even though the cash price overall is still decreasing. So um, kind of two, two options here. Um, so, so one is a hedge, which we spent a lot of time on last week. So that's where you're storing your grain um, and then you're selling futures at the same time. So, so this requires you to have a brokerage account, to have money in the account to handle um, margin calls. Um, you know, if you if you're losing money in the futures market, um, you know that's fine. You're gonna you're gonna make it back um, when you when you sell your sell your grain eventually. 
Um, but in the meantime, you kind of, you owe them money. Uh, and if you don't have it, then that is, you know, a big problem. Um, so that kind of is the big advantage or one big advantage of the hedge to arrive, uh, which is really quite similar, I would say. It's really just an elevator kind of performing a hedge for you. So the elevator uh, allows you to lock in the futures price portion of the cash price. Um, and then you can lock in the basis at, at a later date. So kind of they're ha handling all of the, the, the margin calls and anything going on with the futures contract. You don't own a futures contract. Um, you have a, a hedge to arrive contract with the elevator um, that kind of provides those same benefits as a hedge. Um, but there's a fee associated with it, right? So you know, not, nothing in life is free. Uh, so kind of this, this added flexibility, this added ease of use kind of comes at, comes at some cost. Uh, so just in case kind of you don't like the way that I'm saying it, uh, here's, here's what, how ADM describes it. Um, so it offers you the choice to lock in the futures reference price portion uh, for a specific quantity to be delivered in the future. Uh, and the basis can be set at a later date, but it has to be done prior to delivery. Um, so kind of how it works, you, you pick when you want to go into this. So you, you want to lock in the futures price now. You, you like the futures now you don't think it's going to get better. Um, and then you can kind of wait and see when you want to, to set your basis. So this kind of if you hearken back to last Tuesday when we were talking about break even basis, um, at that time we were kind of thinking in terms of a hedge, but the, the same logic applies to a hedge to arrive. Um, if the basis strengthens so much that you don't expect it to strengthen enough to pay for your storage, then you want to you want to lift that hedge um, and you want to kind of lock in your basis right then. So here's an example. Um, you can hopefully tell from the prices, we're back in a soybeans world. Um, so we're gonna kind of picture ourselves in September. Um, so we already, we're already harvested or are about to harvest. Um, and we're looking at a May futures contract. So, oh shoot, my numbers are getting kind of wonky. All right, sorry about that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna explain this table here. So um, in September, the, the cost of a May futures contract per bushel is 1420 and the basis is negative a dollar. So that's a really weak basis. And we know from historical trends that we expect it to strengthen as we go from harvest into the next summer. So yeah, I don't know what happened with the numbers here. So the cash price should be 1320, right? So we have the futures price, 1420 minus one dollar, that's 1320. Um, and now let's say that we get to February and the basis is negative 40 cents. Um, and so you know we think that's pretty good. And so then we're going to lock in right then and deliver. So we have kind of the 1420. From when we locked in our futures, um, our futures price uh, minus forty um, from the basis that we locked in later, um, and that's going to give us thirteen eighty. Um, and then we have to subtract out kind of some storage costs and some fees that I'm kind of abstracting away from for this simple example. So, and kind of. Like any other contract that you made with an elevator, you know you can't just go deliver it to anyone, right? So you, your contract is with that elevator, um, and then you need to deliver it to them. Um, so now I have uh, another video, um, not by me, but uh, I think a, a useful, another useful resource um, that kind of discusses hedges and hedge to arrives and forward contracts. So. I don't think that it's gonna say anything too new, but I think sometimes it's still beneficial to have kind of things explained a, a few different ways and on a few different tries. So uh, I, hope that, I hope that it's useful. Um, so Claire, if you wanna go ahead and, and load that up. I'll start with the difference between a futures contract and an HTA or futures only contract. And what they do is really accomplish the same thing. And that's offset. Sorry, I just wanna say HTA is a hedge to arrive, the, the, sorry. 
the risk of price fluctuation, let me say, at the Chicago Board of Trade. So there are a few things to consider when determining which one is right for you at the given moment uh, between a futures and an HTA. And the biggest one for me is actually market bias. And, and I say this um, kind of out of one side of my mouth and the other side is saying, I'm not here to guess what the market does, I'm here to manage risk. But you have to think about this when it comes to psychology. If it's early in the year and you think the market has a lot of upside potential, Holding all else equal, I would prefer to do an HTA. And the reason for that is you're using the elevator's money rather than your own to margin the position. A futures contract, uh, just for those who don't know, has a margin requirement, and that's the amount of money you have to keep in your brokerage account to maintain that position. And the way that you manage risk as a farmer with a futures contract is you sell futures. So for a farmer who sold futures, if the market moves up, that means that you are making money on the cash side, but losing money in your brokerage account. And that risk is offset by the increase in the cash market, but you don't realize that gain until you sell those physical bushels. So nonetheless, you have to maintain that margin requirement the whole time, and that means sending in more money oftentimes. So giving you an example with uh, with soybeans, let's say. If the soybean market, for example, rallies a dollar, and you started your account with nothing more than the minimum margin requirement, that dollar move in soybeans is $5,000 per contract, and that's money that you have to send in. And one thing I really want everybody to think about here is that money costs money, either in terms of interest when you're using an operating note or opportunity cost when you're using your own reserves. And by opportunity cost, I mean, can you use that money somewhere else for a better use? Now, on the flip side of that, if you think the market's at its peak, you might be better off selling futures contracts rather than doing an HTA. For one, it's usually cheaper to do it on your own in your brokerage account because the commissions are going to be lower than HTA fees. That's that's the case that I've seen almost anywhere. Further, even though any gains in the futures are offset by losses in the cash, there's that psychological boost for producers who are making money in their brokerage account. And even though it's the same price, regardless which way you go, that psychological boost is there. And when you have the wind at your back, so to speak, you tend to be a more aggressive marketer. And when you're a more aggressive marketer, you're generally a better marketer. So another factor to consider is the variability of your production. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. With an HTA, you're obligated to deliver those bushels no matter what. Either you have to buy the contract back from the elevator if you don't have the production or the bushels are there and, and maybe you've oversold a little bit. But with a futures position, there's no such obligation as long as you offset that position before the delivery period. If you're in an area of the country where yield is more variable, you may be better suited to a futures position so that you don't commit bushels you don't have. Now, one last thing to think about is the ability to control your production as long as possible. As soon as you do an HTA, you commit your production to a specific location. And if you're fortunate enough to be in an area that has a number of different delivery points, you might be better off playing the basis game with them and managing the futures price on your own. Because after all, they're in competition for their bushels and their best weapon is basis. So let's talk about a forward contract for a second. When do you do one of those? Well, really when you only deliver to one or two locations and basis won't improve and you're fairly certain of that, you're probably best off doing a forward contract because, because it doesn't cost you anything. The, the biggest thing that you're giving up here is the opportunity for basis to improve. But like I said, if you're near the higher end of the basis uh, scale based on the seasonals, you're probably better off selling cash to avoid the additional fees. Another time you might want to consider a cash contract is when you have enough carry built into the market and you plan on storing into the next year. We often see some really competitive bids for deferred months and that generally will pay for the storage and then some. So, so if you caught that right at the end, they, he, he mentions um, if you, if a forward contract is good for when you think that a, a strong part, the basis based on the seasonals. So, so what does he mean by that? Um, and he's, he's talking about that, that seasonal trend um, that I, I showed in the first week where we, we go from kind of a really weak basis in the fall at harvest. I mean, it kind of strengthens throughout the winter into the next year. So, so that, that's kind of what that word seasonal means. And that's kind of one tool that you have um, is the historic seasonal patterns in your local area to in, in order to forecast basis. So that's kind of your, your biggest tool is looking at the seasonal trends in your own area um, over the past, past three years. Maybe you go back the past five years and maybe kind of throw out a really high and really low year, um, but kind of 
taking an average of just the past few years to look at kind of what those trends look like for you. All right, so you probably noticed we, we skipped the very first quadrant, but now we're, now we're back to it. So here we have both prices are going up, um, but the futures is going up faster because we have a weakening basis. So in this setting, we want to hold off on locking in the futures price. We want to um, let it increase, um, but we want to lock in the basis now, right? Because it's only going to get weaker. So in this case, there's kind of two options that I'm going to talk about. So one is a basis contract. So in this case, we're going to contract a, a, the price of a product at a fixed discount relative to a futures contract. So um, when you hear discount relative to a future project, uh, sorry, when you hear discount relative to a futures contract, there should be kind of alarms going off in your head that that's what basis is, right? So basis is um, where the cash price is kind of relative to the futures price. So, you know, we're almost always talking about a negative basis, um, at least here in Michigan. So kind of when you have a, a discount of, of 50 cents from the specified futures contract, that's your basis. So when you lock that in, when you fix that discount, you're fixing your basis. Um, so that's exactly what we want to do when we're in this quadrant, um, where we lock in that basis early um, and still allow us to have upside on the futures price. So the other option is kind of a reverse hedge. Um, so you're gonna sell grain now and you're going to buy futures, right? So you, you're, you're selling your grain now, which, so you're locking in both the, the futures, which you don't really like, and the basis, which you really like, um, but you're also buying futures. Um, so that still gives you the opportunity to get um, upside. Um, but you're also able to lock in, lock in your basis. Matt, that's a, a good point. That's what happened this past fall. We had a really strong basis and futures looked like they were pretty strong. And so uh, I think I'm not the only one. So we went ahead and, and kind of sold that product or sold, uh, sold soybeans uh, in in, in uh, November, December, because everything looked good. But then what's happened, the futures have taken off uh, since then. So in hindsight, that uh, that top left quadrant is where we should have been uh, in hindsight. So sorry, just so you, you didn't you didn't buy fit futures, but you wish you would have. Well, sure. Yeah, because yeah. the basis was relatively strong for that time of the year, especially. And so the carry didn't look that good. Uh, and futures are much higher than they've been in, in, in five years. And so everything looked pretty good. It's not going to go much higher was the thought at the time. But of course, as we all know, since then, prices have gone up uh, significantly. And so um, uh, we thought we were in the, in, the, uh, in the bottom left, but we were actually in the top, in the top left. And so somebody asked a question about how do you know all this stuff? Uh, if you knew all this stuff, what the futures is going to do, as I said in my little note there, why the hell are you at this meeting? Okay, <laughs> why do you grow corn to begin with? Okay, because you know which way that market's going to go. You can make so much money by just uh, just uh, trading the paper and so forth with that. But but this is not uh, we're we're not in this to, to make money in the in the futures positions. We're in the in this program to minimize risk and take advantage of prices that look good to us with some indication of what our biases are in the direction of these markets, both on the, the future side and the cash side. Thanks, yeah, the, that, that's great. Um, yeah, and just to, to kind of piggyback off that a little bit, I think, you know, I, I, I really like this chart for kind of to organize our thinking about the different tools and, and how they're different um, and what's locking in which price at which time. Um, but kind of Roger's anecdote is exactly why you don't kind of go you know, all in on, on one strategy, especially kind of if, if it's a risky one. Um, you know, it's why you market your grain kind of using different tools in pieces. Um, so, you know, that way, you know, um, and I, 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 I know I've said this before, but and the, the basis really is easier to forecast in the future. So you can feel kind of a little bit more confident maybe 
um, with your basis forecast, but the futures is, is really difficult. And, you know, if you were great at it, you, there wouldn't be a need to, to grow, to grow corn. Um, and then in hindsight, you know, we, we, it was the right thing to sell cash uh, in the, in the, in the fall, like we did, but we should have bought futures and, and, and moved our, our risk into the opportunity risk in the future side and got out of the cash market. So just to illustrate the point. We'll, we'll get more into, into futures and, and, uh, and options and puts next week to talk about those tools. So we won't talk about those now. Great. Yeah. And um, just kind of based on where, I, where I'm at, I, I, I might be wrapping up um, a little a little bit early, maybe a half hour early. So then if you want to kind of open it up for, for more discussion, we can, we can do that then. Um, all right. Um, so just a, a little bit more on basis contracts. Um, so what, what are the advantages here? Um, you have the flexibility to, to pick it when you like it, right? So if you don't like the basis, you don't get into a basis contract. Um, so you can kind of wait and see. Um, and when the basis is you know, strong and you expect it to weaken, um, kind of that's the right time. Um, it has some of the, the other benefits of, of tools we talked about before, um, you know, no quantity restrictions. Um, typically you can get a basis contract for whatever um, number of bushels you're looking to, to market. Um, and then, you know, this is often something that you'll do with your local elevator. Um, I, I hope that we get a chance to talk about it next week. I, I think we will. Um, you know, you, you probably want to be shopping around. Um, you definitely want to be shopping around. Um, you don't want to just kind of always be using one elevator. You want to make sure that you're kind of shopping around and getting, um, getting someone who's giving you a good price. And especially kind of when you're factoring in um, quality discounts and things like that, um, making sure that you're kind of getting the, the best price for your grain. Um, uh, disadvantages, um, you still are exposed to all that futures risk. So, you know, if you're confident that it's going to go up, that's not a disadvantage. That's really an advantage. You, you want that upside risk. Um, but, you know, in reality, we don't really know whether prices are going up or down. Um, and so a basis contract, you, you're still exposed to a lot of risk. So probably not something you want to put, you know, all your bushels in at the same time. Um, Uh, so this is, a, again, from the, the ADM website. Um, so you, you lock in your basis for a, a given delivery period. Um, and, and within that period, you can, you can pick your futures price. Um, one benefit that I didn't highlight before is that um, you're, you're often able to receive at least a partial cash advance um, after the delivery has occurred. Um, so if you have kind of you know, loan payments that you need to make, um, that cash can help with that. Um, and yeah, sorry, this is <laughs> mostly redundant. Um, so you, you fi fix the basis and then you, um, you come in later and pick the futures when you want to, to lock in that futures price. All right, I'm gonna switch gears um, a little bit dramatically here. Um, so now we're just, I'm going to give a really kind of super high level discussion of, of options. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. I'm just going to kind of explain what they are, give a few definitions, um, look at what they cost. Um, and then next week, I'm going to have a, a lot of examples, both kind of working through the slides and on the chalkboard, um, kind of calculating, you know, when a call is going to make you money, when a put is going to make you money. Um, kind of how you fare under all sorts of different scenarios um, given your buying calls and buying puts. Um, so, but before that, just kind of what's an option? Uh, so an option is a right to buy or right to sell a futures contract at a specified price. So, um, so we've talked a lot about futures contracts. So you, you, this could be any of the contracts. You, you could buy an option for any of them. Uh, but you might think about kind of a, a, a July futures contract and an option is buying the right to buy that at a later date at a specified price. Um, so when would that right be valuable? Well, if the price of the futures contract goes really high and it's really expensive and you have the right to buy it for really cheap, well, that's a really, that option is really valuable, right? Um, if you've, um, kind of paid for the a right to buy at a, a medium price and then the price goes low, um, then that's not very 
valuable option, right? Um, but we should really be thinking about these as insurance. Um, so, you know, we don't know which way prices are going to go, um, but we can pay some money because options cost money um, for these rights to buy and these rights to sell that are going to kind of minimize, not sorry, not minimize, they're going to limit our losses. Um, so kind of we'll, we'll know we're not gonna be able to lose too much because we, we have this right to, right to sell at this price that we've locked in. I think it'll become more clear. I know that that wasn't the most clear. Um, so a call option is the right to buy. So thinking again about a July futures contract, um, you, you pay some money and, and we'll look in a little bit at, at what exactly those premiums are gonna be. Um, you pay some money and you have the right to buy at a specific price. So I might buy an option to a call option for July corn futures at five dollars so um or let's say six dollars um so then i would have no matter how high they get i would have the right to buy at six dollars so you know this morning i think there was 5 30 something um so not very valuable yet but if you know it shot through the moon and, and went up to seven or eight dollars that would be a really valuable right so a put option is the right to sell so um, if, again, if we're thinking about a July futures contract, um, if I had the right to sell at, you know, $5, say I bought a put at a, a $5 strike price, um, again, you know, right now, that's not something that's going to be very valuable because, you know, I don't have to use this, right? I can just sell at the normal price, whatever the market's trading at. But if the prices fell a lot, I would have the right to, to still sell at a price that might be higher than the market price. So it's, I really think the right way to think about this as, is just insurance. You're, you're buying this right that kind of protects you from a really bad situation, right? So you know kind of your worst case um, is limited in how bad it can be because you have bought this option. So a strike price is the price that you bought the right to buy and sell it, right? So, so you, you might buy a call option at a strike price of $6 on a July corn futures contract. So um, this is the price that you're going to have, if it's a call option, the right to buy at, or if it's a put option, the right to, to sell at. Um, so just kind of a, a somewhat silly, mnemonic to, to keep them straight. So uh, a call option, um, it's the right to buy. So you, you're kind of calling for the, the grain. Um, and then the put option, it's the right to sell. So you're putting the grain on someone else. So just kind of a, a way to keep them straight. Intrinsic value. So this is, this is the positive difference between the strike price and the underlying futures contract price. Um, so this, this can't be negative, right? If it's, if it's negative, we're just going to say it's zero. So let's say um, we had a put um, and let's say we had a put for 550 um, and prices and, the, and the, the prices on the contract were trading at $5. So 550 minus $5, it would have an intrinsic value of 50 cents, right? I can sell this contract for 50 cents more than the market is currently trading at. Um, say it was reversed. Say I had a put option for $5 and corn was trading at 550 um, or the futures contract on corn was trading at 550, then it would be zero. Um, because again, it's a, it's a right. It's a right to, to sell if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, so kind of the, the lowest value can have is zero where you just, you know, I have this right and I'm not going to use it. Um, so now we're going to, um, again, I'm going <laughs> to, I've explained, I think, a, a few of the important concepts, and now we're going to um, let someone else give it a try. Uh, so Claire, if you want to load up the, the CME video, videos. Um, oh, wait, sorry. One more, one more thing. I, I forgot the most important part. So um, option premium. So this is the market value of the option. So this is the kind of the price you would pay to buy a call or a put. Um, so kind of 
you know, you can't just get a right to buy for free, you have to pay someone for it. And so this option premium is that price that you have to pay. This is the price of the insurance that you're buying. Sorry, now we can go ahead with those, those videos. Um, there's gonna be three videos and we're gonna play them kind of back to back to back um, and then talk about them just a bit. Option con contract details. Understanding key contract details is essential to determining how and when an option will meet your financial objectives. Choosing the options you want is dependent on your objectives. For example, if you want to protect or hedge some asset, you will need to know the contract details to determine the best fit for your portfolio. When speculating, your trading strategy might be influenced by the contract details. There are four key elements to an option contract. The underlying futures contract, the expiration or maturity date, strike price, and the type of option, either a put or a call. Let's look at each detail. The deliverable for every CME group option is a futures contract. This is called the underlying instrument or the underlier. Futures contracts also have an underlying product such as an interest rate, equity index, a foreign currency rate, or some other commodity. Each option also has its own expiration or maturity date. Owners of options will need to make a decision before the contract expires. Another contract detail is the strike price. This is the agreed price at which a futures contract can be bought or sold. The strike price for the options contract will determine the value of the option, giving the option owner the right to transact at the strike price regardless of where the underlying is trading. The last detail is the type of option, either a call option or a put option. A call option is the right to buy the underlying product at a predetermined price. A put option is the right to sell the underlying product at a predetermined price. Before establishing your option position, you'll need to carefully consider your financial strategy and objectives. Whether you are hedging or pursuing a trading strategy, close alignment of the contract details to your objective is important for achieving the desired results from your option position. Strike price of an option. When you hold an option, you have the right, but not the obligation, to buy in the case of a call or to sell in the case of a put, a specific futures contract before a certain date. One key characteristic of an option contract is the agreed upon price, known as the strike or exercise price. The strike price is the predetermined price at which you buy in the case of a call or you sell in the case of a put, an underlying futures contract if you exercise the option. You can choose from a range of exercise prices that are set at predefined intervals by the exchange. The interval range may vary depending on the underlying futures contract. The exchange sets the interval pricing on options in order to meet the market's need for liquidity and price risk management. So, do all products follow a similar price interval? Not at all. Each product will have a unique price interval rule, based on the product structure and the market need. Even within certain products, the intervals change depending on the expiration month. For example, options on corn futures have an interval of 5 cents for the two front months of the expiring futures contract, and 10 cents thereafter. The full range of strike prices for many options products will be determined by the previous day's daily settlement price for the futures contract. Over time, the entire range may expand beyond the initial listed boundaries due to market movement, and generally, the strike intervals become more granular closer to expiration. Let's look at an example. Today is January 1st, and we are following an options contract that has a December expiration. Assume our array of contracts has a price interval of 10 points and an initial range of 80 to 120 points. As the price of the underlying futures contract moves, the exchange will monitor and adjust the intervals and the range of strike prices. After the first quarter, the market fell to 83 points. Therefore, another strike price at 70 was made available. In the third quarter, the futures contract rallied higher. The contract is now much closer to the expiration and increasing in volume. To meet demand, additional strike prices at one-point intervals are made available between 80 and 100. By the last quarter, the market continued upward and additional one-point intervals were needed between 100 and 110. Strike prices will always be added as necessary, but will not be removed once published. For more information regarding available option strike prices, visit the CME Group's product pages.
Options do not last forever. They expire or terminate. They all have an ending date. Options are tied to an underlying futures product. All futures products have a settlement date. If the futures contract no longer exists, then clearly an option on that contract can no longer exist either. So when do options and futures expire? Once a quarter? Every month? What about every week? When it comes to options and futures, there may be a variety of option expiration dates you could trade for the same futures contract. You may find some option expirations align with the expiration of the underlying futures contract. In other cases, a futures product could have a variety of shorter-term options listed. These shorter-term options offer traders greater precision and flexibility to expand their trading strategies. Let's look at some examples. When it comes to physically delivered commodities, option expirations will expire prior to the futures settlement. This happens so traders have an opportunity to mitigate delivery for the physical product. For example, when WTI crude oil futures settle in June, the WTI option will have a May expiration date. If the option is exercised into the active futures contract, the trader has time to adjust their futures position to either offset the position or make plans to take delivery. Assume the E-mini S&P 500 futures contract, contract code ES, has a settlement date in June. Quarterly options contracts are offered on the E-mini S&P 500 futures contract. In this case, the June quarterly options contract would expire at the same time as the futures contract. Monthly contracts are also offered for the same futures product. With a monthly option contract, you can express a short-term opinion on this longer-dated futures contract. For each listed month, such as May and April, you can trade an option that will expire within a month and settles into the same June ES futures contract. If your time horizon is even shorter, there are also weekly options on E-mini S and P500 futures contracts. A rolling list of five weekly options that expire each Friday is offered on most products. After each weekly front-end contract expires, another back-end weekly is listed. There you have it. Options can have a variety of option expiration dates, which provides flexibility to find a product that meets your trading needs. For more information on specific option expirations, visit the product specifications pages on cmegroup.com. All right. So you can see that that last video uh, kind of showed how things can get uh, pretty confusing. Um, pretty pretty fast um, but I think it's important to to, to note that these um, are really tied to the the underlying contract um, and so kind of they they're temporary things that you use kind of in in tandem uh, with with a futures contract so um, one thing that they sorry let me find where, where I'm at in my slides here um, one thing that they didn't talk about that I wish they had talked about um, is the option premium. So that's going to be really, really important when deciding kind of whether or not these are tools that you want to use is what's the price of the tool, right? Um, so you might really, really want insurance, uh, but if it's too expensive, then you're not going to buy it. So, um, uh, so that's, yeah, important to keep in mind. And in a little bit, we're actually going to jump um, to the Anderson's website, and we're going to kind of look at the prices of some of these uh, calls and puts. But first, I want to just work through um, a really simple example uh, of a put. So this is where you have the, the right to sell. So suppose it's October, and the price of a July's futures contract is 550. You buy a futures contract, and you also buy a put at a strike price of 525 at a premium of 20 cents. So, so this is 20 cents per bushel. Um, and because you're dealing with a futures contract, we're talking about 5,000 bushels. So $1,000 um, just in the, the premium to have this right. Um, so for this example, we're um, just gonna be talking about the futures contract. So we're gonna kind of ignore any actual grain that's being um, bought or sold or stored on the side. So this is just an illustration of a put. And so to do that, we're just going to be talking about a futures contract. So um, 
So let's say we get to uh, we get to June and the July futures price is 560. So you bought it at 550 and it went up to 560. Um, and then we have the cost of the put is 20 cents. So your net price is 540, right? So you you bought this right to sell at 525. But did you use that right? No, because the prices um, were way above it. So you wouldn't want to sell at 525. Uh, you want to sell at the market price of 560. Um, <clears throat> but because you um, paid for this put, you kind of came up behind, um, which, you know, is that's the case with insurance, right? You know, sometimes you buy insurance and you don't use it. Um, and that's, that's what happened here. Uh, but let's say instead of, Instead of 560, we get out to June and the price is $5. So because we bought a put, we have the right to sell at 525. So we can sell for a gross price of 525, but then we have to remember that we, we pay 20 cents a bushel uh, for the cost of this put. So then our net price is 505. Um, sorry, something kind of wonky happened with my tables. I'll definitely have to fix this next time. But so this, this June, July futures price should be $5, right? And we're comparing it to a net price of 505. So we came out ahead, right? So because prices decreased so much, uh, it made up for the cost of the put. Um, we, we came out ahead. At least ahead relative to a world where we hadn't bought the put. But now here's an example where we're gonna exercise our right to sell, uh, but we're still going to kind of have wished that we had not bought the put. So um, let's say that the, the price is 520. Uh, so we have the right to sell at 525. So we have the right to sell at a price that's higher than the market price. So that's good. Um, but because we paid 20 cents for the put, we're gonna end up at 505, which is lower than the market price of 520 that we could be selling at. So um, even if you kind of think you're going to, to use the insurance, if you think you're going to use the, the put or the call that you buy, you have to make sure that you're getting a good enough price on it, that the, the option premium is low enough um, that you can still come out ahead. All right. So now I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at kind of what some of these are trading at today. All right. So you should see the Anderson's website. And so these are, these are calls and puts for corn. All right. So let me, Kind of walk you through what's going on here. Um, so first, let's let's set this for. Let's look at July, or let's look at May futures. So these are options for uh, a May futures contract. So I want you to first focus on this middle column, uh, the strike. So this is the strike price. So this is. Um, what what price you're you're buying the right to either um, buy at or sell at? So um, let's kind of get out of the the crazy prices. Um, I mean, two dollar corn is very far from where we are. So um, so this is on this side. This is the right to buy. Um, a May corn futures contract at 525. Um, and then on the right side of the screen is the information for buying the right to sell a May futures contract at 525. Um, so here's, um, I, I wish they kept the headers on, but here's the premium is on the, the column right next to the, the strike price. And so this is the premium on a 5,000 bushel contract, right? So so let's see. So 
Um, so if we wanted to buy the right to buy uh, a contract at 525, we would have to pay 1500 per contract. So what does that come out to? That's 30 cents per bushel. So that's a lot of money, right? So you would really have to um, be insuring against something that you thought was pretty likely to happen and it would be pretty bad if it did happen for it to make sense to be spending $30 a bushel um, for this call. Um, so that's, that's if we want the right to, to buy at 525. Um, which is, is lower than it's trading. I think it was around five, 545 this morning. I, I could be a little off on that. Um, on this side, we, we're talking about the right to, to sell. And so the premium here is 837. Uh, so I can't do the math perfectly in my head, but I think that comes out to about 17 cents a bushel. Um, so a much lower price. And that makes sense, right? So if you want to buy the right, to buy at a price that's below the market rate, it, it makes sense that they're gonna really charge you a, a lot to do that, right? Um, that's very valuable to be able to, to buy at a price that's lower than it's trading right now. Um, you could kind of turn around and, and make money. If, if the premium was zero, you know, everyone would be buying this call uh, and then buying at 525 and then turning around and selling at 545. So, so there has to be, um, you know, there has to be a, a premium here to, to prevent people from arbitraging. Um, but over on this side, you know, the right to sell at 525, um, you know, isn't quite so valuable. So, you know, if, if it's trading at 545 right now, uh, yeah, maybe it'll go down below 525 and then you'd um, have some value. Um, you'd have an, uh, an intrinsic value that's bigger than zero. Um, but right now you don't. Um, and so it makes sense that the price of buying the right to sell is lower because, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't even get the chance to to use this right. Maybe it would never be useful if if the May futures contract stayed above 525 the whole time that you had it. And even if you thought it was going to dip below 525, right, you wouldn't run out and buy this because it's 17 cents a bushel, right? You would have to think that prices were going to drop um, pretty dramatically um, in order to make this this worth it. Um, so, you know, you can see. As you get to really high numbers, high prices, sorry, not numbers, prices, um, you can see that the, the premiums on the, the call options fall. And that makes sense too, right? Um, you know, is the right to buy, you know, 650 corn very valuable? No, because we probably, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even use that right. It, you know, it probably won't go above 650 before May. Maybe it does. Um, and then if you had bought this call, uh, you'd be in a good position. Um, but on the, the flip side, um, when you look out here at these high prices, um, well, that one's too crazy to even talk about. But yeah, you can see, <laughs> you can see the, the, the premiums on these um, put options kind of go, go through the roof. Um, so kind of higher prices, um, your option premiums on calls are going to be lower and lower. Um, higher strike prices, your option premiums on calls are going to be lower and lower and your option premiums on puts are gonna be higher and higher as the strike price increases. Um, so that's, that's really all um, that I have on uh, calls and puts for this week. Um, and next week, we're going to be working through a, a, lot, a lot of examples um, where we're actually kind of calculating um, under different scenarios, kind of which, which call strategies work and which ones don't work depending on kind of different price realizations. Um, so I'm going to go back to my slides. Uh, so next week, we're gonna go back to this, this pricing diagram, but we're gonna fill in kind of all the gaps that we left out, right? So we, we skipped over um, anywhere where we were talking about calls and puts. Um, and now we've kind of outlined some of the basics, um, hopefully piqued everyone's interest. Um, and then next week, we're going to be really filling in the gaps. Um, so uh, that will probably be about an hour of next week. Um, we'll just be kind of working through examples of calls and puts and then kind of pairing each kind of 
call put strategy with the market quadrant that makes sense for it. So kind of what what do we do when basis is strengthening and futures, we expect them to go up um, if we're dealing with options, kind of what's the option strategy for that. So uh, that'll probably be about one hour. Uh, then we'll have um, some industry guests from MAC um, talking about um, logistics. So kind of not, not what to do. Hopefully you have kind of at least some improved sense of kind of what, what tools you might want to use. Um, but, you know, how do you go from knowing kind of, oh, I think I want to, you know, do a hedge to arrive to actually implementing that. And so they'll have, I think, good insight into that. Um, and then we'll kind of tie things together uh, with a brief review. So I know I, I'm pretty ahead of schedule, so that, that wasn't intentional, but uh, I think now would be a good time to open it up for, for some discussion uh, with myself and Roger um, for a little bit, um, and then maybe maybe we'll conclude a few minutes early and just plan on a meeting back here next week. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. So I think the way that we have it, um, people aren't able to speak. So you just type type the questions in, in the Q&A um, and we'll kind of do our best to discuss those and talk about those. So we'll wait a little bit, but if no one has any questions, then at some point we'll have to, we'll have to call it a night. Um, you want to go over a couple of the questions in the Q and A, just that have already been answered by Roger? Yeah. Um. Sorry, there was one that I one that I saw Roger's response that I wanted to talk more about. Um. Oh, where can I find it? Here we go. Um. Yeah, so on a forward contract, I, I didn't talk about that, but you often also have the option to um, to roll it forward, basically, where you kind of don't deliver right then, but you're going to kind of elect to, to roll it forward and, and see how um, prices evolve. So that's kind of a, an added flexibility in a forward contract. Um, and then typically, if you are in a hedge to arrive, um, that can be converted to um, a forward contract if you like the prices. So you you lock in the prices, but you you don't deliver. You're going to keep storing it. Um, and then kind of your hedge to arrive turns into a forward contract. Um, all right, some new questions. Is there a way to look at the history of an expired month's option prices? Um, say I forward sold in June for December, but didn't buy any options, but want to research different scenarios. Mm, I am pretty sure you can do that if you pay for DTN. Um, Roger, do you know of any other potentially free resource that would have historical um, options prices on expired contracts? Uh, not for sure. I don't see that question. Is that in the question answer? Uh, it's in the Q and A. It's an unanswered question. Ah, I'm in there. I don't see it. Ah, open. Um, yeah, that that history is available. I'm not sure. Uh, I have DTN, and I can see a lot of those things. Uh, you know where they're at and so forth. Uh, um, I see right here. Yeah. So I I. My hunch is that that's something where you you need to be kind of in a service that gives you that gives you that data, um, but I, I don't actually I, I'm not actually positive on that. Um, so I'm going to say that we answered it live, even though <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, the uh, Andersons with some of their tools, they quite often and most of the elevators, um, the various tools that they'll have, they'll show the historical performance of that particular tool. And so local elevators uh, are, you know, uh, Andersons and others, I think, will, will show you that history of what that particular tool has done. And that's not exactly what he's asking here, but it is looking at some of those tools uh, that they are using. 
Yeah, I was actually looking at that earlier today. I, I ultimately ended up not to not to work it into the workshop, but may, maybe if we have time, I'll show it next week. But it's it's pretty neat where you can kind of look at the different pricing tools that they offer and you can kind of compare it to you know, how you would have done if you had done something different, basically. Um, yeah, Afton is asking uh, a May contract. There's different months in which you uh, can... Um, you know, trade the trade the, the the futures contract months, and um, if we're talking futures, you don't exercise that. The, the term exercise, uh, that's what it says. Option by May. Uh, sometimes those options will get exercised because they're in the money when they go to go to the expiration time period, and so they're in the money, and so then those things will be exercised, and you'll end up with that with that futures position at whatever price you bought the uh, strike price you, that, that you bought uh, that future uh, options contract at that makes sense yeah i i'm gonna i'm gonna uh basically repeat and, and phrase differently just because you know sometimes it helps to have things phrased differently so so the may futures the may 21 futures contract that's the contract that is expiring the futures contract that's expiring in a, in a few months coming up here um so this is kind of a an obligation to if you bought one of these contracts you would be saying you know i agree to take delivery uh, of this of this product of 5000 bushels um, so that's that futures contract um, so may is just one of the ones they have you could have march uh, july september december um, and then those options are are specific to a, a specific contract so um, you know when you're talking about an option you have to know kind of what contract you're talking about um, having that option for um, so hopefully, yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, uh, and in the commodities, those uh, option contracts like on May will typically expire oh, probably a month ahead of time before the before the futures position contract expires. So those will be exercised maybe a month. That'll give you a time. Whoever get done, gets exercised and cut, gets into that futures position, it gives you time to, to get out of that position. Yeah, and that and that's really it comes back to the fact that these are even though very few of these contracts are delivered on, there is kind of this delivery mechanism behind them, right? So we, um, you know, they don't want to be forcing anyone to deliver who doesn't want to deliver. So that's why the options expire before to give to give people time to kind of get out of the market um, or, you know, to make plans for delivery. Um, All right, I'm just kind of scrolling through the questions that are answered. Um, feel free to, to type in new questions um, if you have them. I did launch the closing poll. So for those of you who are on, if you don't mind taking that and giving us some feedback, that would be awesome. Um, so, so David asks, uh, I know that the example is simplified, but there is, is a cost of, of buying the insurance. Um, and then Roger, you wrote, um, in hindsight, an option strategy is always in second place, but is to pass the risk to somebody else willing to be paid to take the risk. Um, could you, could you actually expand on that just a little bit? Well, that's what, what, what you're really paying for. Uh, the the time value of the of that uh, option um, there's a time period to risk the longer the time period the more you're going to pay for it because there's more opportunity or risk of that price moving and so that option premium is going to be reflective of the volatility in the market uh, like right now options are probably pretty expensive compared to other times because you've got such wild swings in the market and so there, everybody's, you know, is the price going to go up higher and, and uh, you know, uh, so somebody else to take that risk of the price going higher and being on the wrong side of the market, uh, that may be higher now because of the, of the, uh, of the volatility in the market right now. And a, a December um, of 21 option premium versus a, a July 
uh, 21 option premium for the same difference from the from the actual underlying futures trading price option price you're going to pay more for that December for that difference because of the uh, the uh, more time value that's uh, involved for that option premium. Um, oh the, yeah, the, so so, the reason... so David elaborated on his point. Um, so so not only is there the option premium, um, there's also kind of the the fees associated with buying an option, and and that's that's true. So I, I ignored those in my example. Um, I mean they're they're going to be small relative to the premium, but they could be. Um, they could be important and and you're right they they, they should have been in there um, and, and in the examples that i kind of work out next week on the chalkboard um they will be in there um so uh yeah that's that's a good point um what do i owe the elevator if i contract for four dollars and the price goes to five and i can't deliver um i think you're five in a really bad plus? situation i don't, I don't <laughs> four dollar plus <laughs> You're going to have to buy back the, the difference in the, um, they don't really want you to, uh, they, they really want you to deliver. And so every elevator is different in what they may or may not be able to do with you. Uh, I've been short a couple of times and uh, myself, I've oversold and I've actually bought corn from a neighbor that I know and they deliver it in my name and I pay them directly. You got to watch your crop insurance history and some of those kinds of things, start playing those kinds of uh, strategy and games. I've also done it for other folks before I've delivered for them uh, on some corn and so forth. And so uh, when you're a little bit short in what you think you had. Um, so you got to uh, typically um, you you have to buy the difference in the uh, in what the cash price is. Uh, you got to buy it somehow and deliver on that contract. Uh, on paper, they may charge you an extra dime or 20 cents additional beyond that actual price difference because they really don't want you to not deliver on that contract. All right, we can we can um, stick around um, if there's if there's more questions. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see the, the poll results. Um, could we could we make those um, the, the one with the they selected which kind of pricing tools they had used? Could we make those ones public, Claire? Um, okay, yeah. So um, that's really interesting. That's um, mostly mostly I think. It's close to what I expected. So a majority have used forward contracts. That's not surprising. Um, you know, over half have used basis contracts. Um, the hedge and then the hedge to arrive um, are are much lower. I'm, I'm a little surprised actually that the hedge to arrive isn't 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 a little higher than that. Um, maybe that's something that um, people can take away from this. I think that's a, a pretty valuable tool um, for kind of the right market situation. Um, and then yeah, no surprise that the puts and calls. Um, are a little more advanced. Uh, thanks. That's interesting. All right, one more, one more question. Um, it'd be nice if you can give more examples that are real from the past uh, of which was the best choice at that time, um, buying or selling puts and calls. Yeah. So, so there's kind of two two ways to look at the past, right? There's there's looking at the past and with hindsight, kind of where we know what what all the right choices was, and then there's Kind of looking at the past through a lens that we want to manage our risks. Risk, so we don't know what the future holds, and we, we want to kind of um, be able to to manage that. So, um, yeah, we can we can we can talk about more real examples. I think also probably during the the Q and A next week um, with MAC, uh, they'll have um, some good insight into that. But I think, um, yeah, I do think that it's important to kind of know all the tools. Um, and then kind of use a combination so that you're managing risk. What do you think about that, Roger? Oh, we lost Roger. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Um, we were just, 
Yeah, we were just talking about this last this last open question. Um, kind of thinking about yeah. when we when we look at the past, thinking about whether kind of we want to thinking about maybe what would be optimal with the benefit of hindsight, and then also kind of keeping in mind that we, you know, we don't know what's coming. So we want to kind of have a, a strategy that manages that risk. Yeah, part of the, my question or point on the on the options is you either after an option is done, okay, you either should have done nothing or probably gone with a futures position instead. Okay, because versus an option because of the cost of the, the time value of it and some of those kinds of things is, is lost. Uh, and that's why an option is always second best, but it, it's a very good tool um, when you really don't know what the market's going to do. You you think it's going to do this, but you're concerned that it might not. And then you're willing to pay somebody to take that risk away from you and give you, uh, give you the opportunity, but, the, but not the downside risk, um, whatever that may be. And of course, most of our examples are targeted for somebody trying to sell a crop, uh, sell corn, sell soybean, sell wheat, uh, versus from a livestock producer needing to buy uh, corn and those kinds of things. And so sometimes that gets confusing on which side, you, if you're hedging to buy or hedging to, to sell, uh, makes a difference as well. Um, then uh, Dan has a question, can you roll an option into a different month? Um, I'm pretty sure you can't. I, these are these are specific to a given contract. Um, yeah, the only way you could roll would be to get out of one and get back in the other one. I mean, that's what really happens with a with a futures contract as well. It's the same kind of thing. Um, I mean, you can is just simply selling one and buying buying back into it on the other side. Um, but there's there's um, no guarantee that the premium kind of wouldn't be. The be market will be right? the market, whatever yeah, the, market the market is in that particular time uh, that you want to roll. It's, it's not any different than what a futures positions would be. All right, we're down to down to seventy seven. So I think. Uh, we'll wrap up a little bit, a little bit early this week, um, and then looking forward to seeing you all back here uh, next Tuesday. Um, yes, thank you, Matt and Roger, again for putting this on for week two. I will be sending out an email tomorrow with the links to the videos that we had, and as well as the re uh, recording from today, so people can go back and review them before next week. And then next week, if there's any materials ahead of time, we'll make sure we get those sent out. Otherwise, we'll see everybody back here on Zoom again um, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Great. Thank you so much, Beth and Roger. Thanks. You're welcome.